Okay, let's start. Um, first of all, I, uh, I am a researcher in IIT. I, I want just to, to introduce our uh, research institute. The IIT stands for Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, which in English would uh, uh, be Italian Institute of Technology. This is a research center with a headquarters in Genova, in Italy, North uh, uh, West. Uh, and then uh, there is a series of uh, uh, centers uh, building up a network throughout the uh, <coughs> uh, entire uh, uh, state, uh, the country, sorry. Um, uh, I am working in the uh, research center in Milan, called uh, Centers for Nanoscience and Technology. The uh, topics uh, that we deal with in IIT are quite uh, uh, different. We have four domain pillars. And we have robotics, nanomaterials, life tech, and computational sciences. Um, uh, I am active uh, and our center is active in the <coughs> nanomaterials uh, domain. The center in Milan is anticipated called the Center of Nanoscience Technology uh, holds four different research lines and I'm in charge of the printing and molecular electronics one. So which is the context of what we do and what I'm gonna show you today. This, the context is, uh, you already heard of, is flexible and large area electronics. So fabrication of electronics in form factors and shapes that are non-conventional. There are several ways you can approach that. Uh, there is not only printing, uh, there are many different technologies, but uh, our way of going towards the large area is printing and printing as you already heard or <laughs> during these uh, uh, seminars it's a, a common way uh, to reproduce information uh, in high volumes at low cost so it, it goes back to uh, Ch chinese ancient uh, wood uh, block printing and then they, uh, the first press machine was invented by Gutenberg. So we have 500 years, 600 years of technology developed to reproduce that kind of information. So we are trying to use this sort of graphical arts printing machine to uh, develop electronics. And we can do that because we have solution processable functional materials. So we have semiconductors and they can be different forms. So you can have inks of organic molecules, you can, you can have precursors of metal oxides, you can have perovskites, you can have uh, 2D materials in. So you have a lot of uh, semiconductors uh, you can choose from. Uh, we have we do have conductors, and again, we can have organic conductors, like uh, we previously described Peter PSS, or we can have metallic inks. And uh, metallic inks have been developed a lot in the last 20 years, I would say. It's, uh, Start, uh, choosing two, two different uh, kind of uh, approaches. One is to use uh, colloidal, colloidal uh, basically uh, nanoparticles, uh, where the trick is to make the nanoparticle smaller and smaller to uh, lower the sintering temperature. So the temperature required to turn your ink into a metallic path. Huh? Uh, you want to lower that to save energy and to be able to process these materials on flexible substrate. The other uh, approach is to use uh, complexes, uh, where you don't use a nanoparticle, but the uh, <coughs> metallic element, indeed, with different chemistry, and that and the targeting uh, uh, chemistry that allows stable ink formulation uh, at room temperature, but uh, a low temperature uh, conversion onto your uh, substrate. And we do have now gold, uh, silver, copper inks, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and the, the obvious thing that we have uh, and we had before it's uh, dielectrics that's the most obvious thing to have with uh, 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 carbon based uh, solution processable materials so we have all the components that we need to make electronic devices so <clears throat> our approach what uh, in the lab is to use and study different uh, conjugated polymers mostly so small molecules sometimes uh, and the, the deposit them with the common approaches like spin coating. Then when uh, we use the uh, information, the, the knowledge that we develop, like uh, how we can inject charges into these uh, solution processable materials, how we can transport charge and so on, this knowledge we transfer to develop the electronic devices with the desktop printers, like the one that you see here and you saw also before. And when uh, the, our the research is more mature, we try to move to our pre-industrial or uh, industrial uh, tools. Um, 
to show a very briefly a couple of, of cases. Uh, the first case is uh, uh, our startup Rebestec. We've created this in 2016, and it's dedicated uh, to uh, indoor photovoltaics, so organic indoor photovoltaics. Uh, this is something uh, we discussed also before. So the, the, the goal is to uh, um, tune the uh, films, the printed films, to uh, harvest uh, uh, artificial light uh, of, in offices, in supermarkets, and so on, to power already existing electronic applications. Uh, it's like uh, for domotics, beacons, and so on. So uh, distributed sensors, IoT, um, Following up on the discussion before, the, 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 the thing is that we have now uh, products, like we say there are products in uh, printed photovoltaics. We, we had that for, for a long time, actually. Um, there are applications where they uh, can have a, a, an interest. Still, this technology is looking for the big uh, boom. Huh? Someone really, a big company or a big group trying to put a lot of money to develop uh, uh, one application. That is uh, it's not happened already. Um, and so um, that is something which is uh, to be considered. And regarding the scaling up, for sure, uh, we need to scale up uh, these processes to make them economically uh, viable. Yet, how to scale it up? Uh, uh, from uh, when you look at the market, it's a different, difficult challenge because if you scale up too early, you are producing kilometers of waste, basically, because no one is buying it. And that happened to Conarca, the first uh, startup company in photovoltaics. But if you scale up too small or too, too little or too late, when your first customer comes, you will not be able to fulfill the requirements and you're out of business. So it's a different, it's a, okay. Uh, when you look at the real application, things uh, I, I, I take a different perspective. Anyway, uh, uh, a photovoltaic film is also a, a sensor in a way. Yeah? So you can use this kind of things to, to add simple functionalities in what's already existing. And you see here a case eh, where these uh, things by uh, Ripestack are used to change a normal push button, an already existing one, just putting a, uh, 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 some uh, a film uh, uh, underneath uh, into a touchless. So the, you, of course you can do build a new one, but uh, building a new one touchless does not fulfill, for example, the fact that you have to keep the the blind reading. And so you can take a normal uh, push button, put this uh, film behind, and then other functionality at very very low. Uh, this is an example how you can use film uh, printed film. So now coming um, ooh, got stuck here. Okay, uh, coming back to the graphic uh, uh, printing techniques, uh, we, as, as you heard already, we have many that uh, uh, have been developed and we can use to print uh, uh, electronics. Uh, there is uh, inject, slot die, screen printing, gravure, flexo, and so on and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the way you choose them is, uh, as uh, this has already been discussed, depends on what you want to achieve and what kind of material you have. Uh, there is a, I'm, I'm, it's a bit slow now, okay. Um, so the, for example, uh, different techniques have, are optimized for different viscosities, uh, for different final thicknesses that you want, can achieve for different feature sizes. Uh. So and if, therefore, if you need uh, to print photovoltaics, you don't need a, a, a very refined feature size, you may be ha happy with uh, screen printing. Huh? But if you are doing microelectronics, uh, you can't uh, do much if you have a 100 micro uh, resolution. Of course, uh, what I'm going to show you in a moment now, it's uh, two techniques that we use the mostly to develop a printed transistor. So it's inject and uh, uh, barcoding, which you don't see here because it's a less uh, used for uh, mass scale production. Uh, so inject is a uh, mm, uh, very well known uh, technique, uh, and there is, there, it, it can be used in two different uh, modes. One is continuous. This is made for marking products at very very high speed. So you basically have a continuous jet that you uh, get destabilized and create droplets, and you deflect the droplets against your target, and you. Well, recirculate the one that you don't need to pattern. But this is not used basically for print electronics. There are some cases, but 
it's not highly used. What we use is the open demand as Daria previously introduced. So where we produce uh, droplets uh, when we need them with uh, a piezo of transducer typically. Uh, we create an acoustic wave and we eject a droplet on a screen which is moving, which is our substrate. There is a full series of, of tools that you can use. There are, there was, I think, now this is out of fashion, but I used uh, 10 years ago or more uh, custom printers where you build everything your own. And then you have prototyping printers like the, the famous Dymatics here. And then you have development printers where the number of nodes, basically what changes is the number of nodes. So one nozzle, uh, cartridges with 16 nozzles, cartridges with 120 20 or 256 nozzles, up to production printers, cartridges of thousands of nodes. Uh, and you see how big these printers are. Um, <clears throat> so there is already a technology, and then it's a meant how you use. Uh, so the, 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 the game is how you can use that to develop your specific uh, printed electronic application. So going back a little bit to fundamentals, when we talk about using inject printing, so we have to create droplets, right? So if we have to create droplets, we are talking about surface tension. I don't want to go to, I mean, to take it too far, <laughs> too, too far, but just to remember what is, we, we, these droplet forms, because we are basically ejecting a fluid into air, and so we have an interface. So if you, if you think this is water, the molecules inside the droplet will, uh, uh, we will uh, feel forces which are in equilibrium. So you, we have uh, uh, molecules pulling and uh, pushing with the same uh, force inside. But at the interface, for example, the molecules in air will pull much differently the molecules uh, of water inside and vice versa. So you have a, basically uh, this strong uh, um, <clears throat> drop of pressure at the interface. And the way to minimize it is to create a, a basically a spherical form. And that's why we have a, we have a sphere. And uh, uh, so this surface uh, tension, which is a force uh, for uh, unit lens, uh, has the typically the unit of Newton per meter, which is in the, sta uh, in the standard unit. Unfortunately, we still use some non-standard units and uh, you will hear about dynes per centimeter, uh, which is millinewton, millinewton per meter uh, most of the time. This is a very important uh, uh, concept. And uh, we want to create a droplet by uh, basically creating a, 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 a perturbation in the nozzle. Uh, if you think this is your nozzle, uh, you, typically what you have is a transducer, which is a piezoelectric, and you apply voltages uh, in some, uh, with some shapes, and you deform the piezo and the nozzle in order to eject a droplet from its orifice. So the smallest, basically, that we can do with standard inject printing in, in volume, uh, it's a, a, a picoliter. With the nozzle sizes so with a meter of roughly 10 micron or so. Below that, uh, the radiology won't, won't allow you to, to eject any, any drop. And this is technique, it's nice, but whoever has worked with it in the lab knows that you're always fighting with clogging. Yeah? You have your nozzle getting clogged and clogged. Um, so it's, it's a, a quite a, a hard work in the lab. And what determines the, the, the stability and the quality of the printing are parameters that already were covered before. And I, I would like to go just to give you some example very briefly, which is a viscosity, boiling temperature, and surface tension. Uh, why viscosity? Well, because we need the, well, the rheology should work there. So we need to eject the droplet of something which is, should be, have low viscosity. And we need to stabilize and the acceptable range is uh, very low. So it's uh, uh, basically one to 20 millipascal second or in non-standard units, centipost. And if you have to look at here, so water is close to one uh, millipascal second. What you would not be able to eject, for example, is olive oil, right? You, you, you see it is 80 millipascal per second, just to give a, an idea of what these numbers means, okay? So because it is important, your formulation has to be uh, quite diluted. And then the surface tension is another critical uh, um, parameter in, for two cases. First, because for the stabilization of the jet. 
So the acceptable range, you can see here, is roughly between 20 and 70 millinewton per meter. So this is, as we surface tension, like the tendency to form that droplet. So, uh, for example, water is in the high range, but it's good, 70. Yeah? And the uh, typical organic solvent that you see here would be good for that. Mercury, for example, would have a huge surface tension that does not allow you to form a single droplet. You would have a spray of very small droplets, so it's not possible to control. Then the, uh, for the stabilization of the jet, you have to use the, the right uh, the right solvent, the right boiling point. If the boiling point is too low, it's impossible to stabilize the jet because you will have a, easy, a very fast evaporation of the, from this small volume and the position of your solute at the orifice, start destabilizing it or even clogging it. So uh, that's why you can't inject print chloroform solution, for example. That's, that's not possible at room temperature, at least. Um, or the chloromethan solution, right? even worse. Um, so typically, you have a mixture of uh, low boiling point solvents and high boiling point solvents that stabilizes your, your jet. So then, you, if you have stabilized it, the droplet at your nozzle, hmm, then uh, the droplet at some point eventually will end up on the surface. And you uh, saw already previously that there are uh, parameters to take into account to, to understand whether you will wet or not the surface. And all of that comes down to a contact angle. So while your droplet is on the surface, you have to, uh, you need to have an equilibrium between, uh, among different interfacial tensions. So solid, liquid, solid vapor, and liquid vapor interface. So this is the Young equation that should be respected. And well, typically, the, the, the vapor is your uh, lab. So that we keep it as a constant. And therefore, what you are playing is, is the interplay between the surface tension of the droplet and the surface energy of the substrate. So the higher the surface tension of your droplet, uh, the smaller would be the, um, the, the, the uh, contact vapor. Okay, so it will be more difficult uh, for the droplet for your material to, to, to wet the substrate. Why? Because there is an interface with a different, very different forces which are exerted on the molecules inside the droplet uh, or at the interface with the solid. And uh, on the other side, if you lower down, so sorry, if you make the higher the surface energy of your substrate, the lower the contact tender. So there, there will be much, it will be much easier to put your, your surface. Of course, if you use Teflon instead, which is a very low surface energy, it will be very, almost impossible to wet it. And therefore you would have basically almost a sphere on top of your surface. And this is what is described in this, to this uh, small video, if I'm able to. Um, no, I'm not. I think I have to be a bit. Okay, so this is what water droplet printed on Teflon. So they don't even move, they stay there fixed. You can dispense in this way materials and fluid, but this is not made for printing. This is for placing. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, exactly what happens if you uh, try to the print, and print, for example, uh, commercial metallic inks, uh, engineered inks, onto a uh, perfluorinated polymer. Could be cytop or other kind of polymer. They, so they, this, this uh, droplet, they don't know where to go. They follow it. Uh, e, 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 e. Maybe they can be pinned so, to some dust or dirt on the substrate, but you cannot form, part, form patterns. While if you coat then in, in your interface and you try to uh, increase the surface energy, then you can stabilize a nice pattern. Of course, also. Uh, your droplet ejection rate versus substrate velo velocity will determine what you print. If you go too fast and you're ejecting too slow, you will have single uh, uh, droplets eh? eject uh, on, on the substrate. While if you go too slow, you will have too much fluid into your pattern, and so you have instabilities like this, this like this bulging. If you uh, optimize everything, you can have nice control lines. And this is not all, because then your fluid is made of a solute and a, a solvent or solvents. And but you want what you want to optimize is the solute deposition, right? your your solid state material, right? Not not the pattern itself. And for that, you have to be careful of flows that can develop inside your printed uh, 
patterns. One very well known is coffee state. Uh, uh, interestingly, it was actually rationalized uh, not, not long ago uh, in a nature paper I began in 1997. Mm, I mean, keeping it short, what happens is that your um, evaporating flux diverges eh, towards the uh, thinning line of your of, 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 of your uh, of your fluid eh? because it basically is proportional to the normal derivative to this uh, to the shape of your of your pattern on, on the uh, subject and therefore the evaporation rate at the peak here will be much faster uh, basically removing much faster therefore the uh, the, the, the solvent and what happens that the, the that from the uh, center, uh, center of the droplet, you will have a uh, flow uh, to replenish uh, the pinning line. And this brings uh, with it the solute, which cannot be evaporated if it's not volatile. It, it will stay there. So it's, you have the solute being dragged by the fluid at the edges and then evaporation. So you have the, the, basically the deposition of most of the solute at the edges. And you, find the, and, and you create this kind of shape that you may like or not depending on what you want to achieve. Uh, the other um, flow that can take place is the Marangoni flow. This is what I like a lot because you can observe whenever I have a, a cup of nice, uh, a glass of nice wine. Basically, this is due to the difference in surface tension of uh, uh, molecules inside your formulation. As already told you, typically to optimize a fluid, you need to put inside different solvents. But then with the solvents, if they have different surface tension, they will exert on uh, uh, each other molecules different forces. And if I have a gradient for some reasons where I have separated these two solvents, I will have an, a, a net uh, movement uh, from one uh, to the lower uh, surface tension uh, part to the higher surface tension because of these forces. And how it, it occurs into a, a, a glass of wine, well, you have ethanol and water, mostly, right? For capillary, for capillarity, you have your, uh, your solution drag onto the walls. There, you have a lot of surface uh, where in the evaporation and very thick layer of, of your wine. So you have a fast evaporation of the ethanol and you have a watery, uh, fluid on your walls. And that watery fluid creates a gradient with respect to the, to the reservoir, which is a bottom. So it drags even more uh, 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 wine than it, solution than it should for just for capillarity. And then at some point, this is known, of course, it, 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 it can't drag uh, 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 as much as uh, he wants, so it wants. So therefore, at some point, when we, uh, for gravity, the uh, some Tears will form to uh, recollapsing your uh, fluid uh, back. And so this is how the, the tears are, are formed. Uh, but this is for uh, a glass of wine, what happens uh, on uh, if we try to use functional inks. This is an example with a, 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 an ink formulation by Kibun Cho, Professor Kibun Cho post a long time ago. Uh, it's a tip fantasy uh, single drop, well, single droplet, yeah and in different formulations. You see, start from this case, a formulation in a pure color benzene is not enough to create a uniform droplet, and you have the formation of a coffee stain because of the uh, fast evaporation at the edges. Then if you mix it chlorobenzene with hexane, you can find here uh, the different boiling point of surface tension. Hexane is, a, is even a lower boiling point, so it makes uh, coffee stain even worse. But instead of mixing uh, chlorobenzene, say you, you mix chlorobenzene like chlorobenzene, like chlorobenzene at a much higher uh, boiling point, 180, and that this allows to uh, suppress the coffee stain effect and create a nice uh, uniform uh, uh, profile. What can uh, happen more is that, is that if you use dodecane instead of like chlorobenzene, so a uh, high boiling point, you suppress coffee stain, but lower surface tension, so you can create a backflow uh, because you are evaporating from the uh, edges, the uh, more, uh, more volatile part, which is the chlorobenzene. Therefore, um, 
the decay will be uh, in a higher uh, concentration and will be dragged back because it has a surface, a lower su surface tension to the center. And you can create this flow uh, that starts from the edges and goes toward the center, and that can create some nice, oh, not so clear probably in this uh, image, but some nice uh, crystallization patterns for your uh, functional molecules. Mm -hmm. This is just a, 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 an example, of course. So uh, we can, you can play around with flows and mix concentration, and you can make a lot of things. This is just an example it's going to another extreme, where you can inject print single crystals huh, for transistors, for example, using a mixture of solvents and antisolvents plus a, a patterned uh, reservoir huh, on, on, on your subject. So this requires also a confined uh, 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 space where you put your, your solvent, but I don't want to go into the details. Huh? This is uh, all the uh, literature uh, that you can look it up if you are interested. So another uh, technique, which is uh, you can you may add when you are you doing inject printing. So of course, inject printing allows you an immediate two D pattern, right? Uh, sometimes you may not need it, and you can uh, adopt a. a a blanket um, the coverage of your substrate, and you may use uh, some uh, uh, coating techniques like bar coating. This is very, very simple. It's used for testing uh, basically uh, uh, paint uh, in industry, not really used for production as far as I know, but it can be very handy in the labs. It is a uh, contact or non contact techniques. You have a, a wire which is one around a steel bar, and the gap in between the wires, which depends on the wire diameter, determines the uh, thickness of your wet layer. And you can quote with that. And we have an example here from the labs of uh, Professor Young, you know, a colleague and friend. Uh, this is just to show you how, how easy it is to coat with a, a semiconductor formulation a large array of transistors. So I'm now coming to uh, transistors. So these are uh, the things that uh, you can print uh, with, uh, with uh, printing technology and allow you to make microelectronics. Okay, we heard about uh, harvesters. Uh, harvester would uh, allow you to power up devices and these devices at some point may need some control, some logic, some uh, uh, conditioning of your signals, and for that you need electronics, uh, electronic circuits, and the building block of a circuit is a transistor. What you are seeing is a, a cartoon of a sketch of a field effect transistor where there is a substrate, plastic substrate, you have source and drain electrodes, uh, you have a semiconductor, a dielectric, and a top gate. Just to be on the same line, this is a three terminal device where you can control the flow of current from source to drain into your semiconductor by applying a third, uh, a controlled, let's say, gate bias to the, your gate electrode. And based, based on the electrostatics here, yeah, you can uh, alter the conductivity of the semiconductor. We have nowadays many materials we can choose from to create this kind of. Uh, Printed devices, and I'm going to show you a routine process that we do uh, or use in our labs for our years now uh, to create these devices. So you can inject print your sus and drain electrodes by, for example, made of uh, PDOT PSS. You can choose your semiconductor formulation and print the semiconducting channel. You can coat with bar coating uh, your dielectric layer on top. And then you can come and inject print a PDO PSS electrode on top, and you have your transistor from scratch made, made in the lab. Um, of course, it will be limited by the poor lateral resolution of poor or not poor, depend on what you want to achieve, of the lateral resolution of your uh, of the technique. Huh? So the state of the art techniques that you can uh, use in the lab have tens of microns uh, resolution. Nevertheless, you can make nice uh, transistors, P-type or N-type, based on good hole transporting or good electron transporting materials. These are very well known and actually uh, old generation, I would say now, uh, polymers, polymer semiconductors. And you can see here the transfer currents and the, the linkages of both. As you see, they are working at very high voltages. And the reason is that when you coat the dielectric, you typically use a uh, known polymer dielectric, which, which have very low dielectric constant. 
and uh, first of all, and then you tend to print them thick because I think I mean hundreds of nanometers because otherwise it's very difficult to avoid uh, leakages or even uh, shorts because of pinholes and defects. And this is a limit, of course, because when you have uh, an area capacitance, which is in the range nanofarad square centimeter, and uh, forces you to use tens of volts to accumulate your channel in the transistor. So this is not compatible, for example, with the harvesters that the Yabaran showed before. And it's impossible to power them up because they are high voltage. So we need to reduce it. And there are many ways, and there, is a, there has been a lot of activity here. Um, there are different uh, approaches. I show you one here, which is a, an hybrid approach where we combine printing with a physical deposition technique, basically a, a CVD, or, uh, which is industrial scale, the CVD for parallel, for parallel, which is a very well-known dielectric uh, that it can be coupled inside um, these materials. So this is a capacitor made of metal, uh, insulator metal, and you can see that with 100 nanometers or so of parallel, you can achieve capacitances in the orders of tens of nanofarad square centimeter with the uh, low leakages. So if we use uh, uh, sorry, this stack in the same devices that I showed you before, uh, we've just typically we don't use parallel uh, on itself by itself. It introduce a, 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 an inter layer. It's a low K polymer dielectric, extremely thin, to decouple basically the interface from the semiconductor. The very most uh, the most important interface is uh, this one here from the semi, um, between semiconductor and polymer dielectric. And typically that is very, very optimized for your uh, semiconductor. So if you want to decouple the process, you put this layer here and parallel can then be introduced on top. And this tech now uh, is capable of working for PNN type devices with very low voltages, below 10, but down to a couple of volts. Therefore, you can with this you can uh, you have PNN type you can make uh, you can make complementary circuits uh, complementary logic and you can build all the building blocks that you need in the logic. So ring oscillators, uh, of course, you can make uh, logic gates, uh, NOR, NAND, and you can make uh, flip flops. So these are dynamic memory elements. So one this is one bit of dynamic memory elements that you need in circuits. Um, these are uh, all organic, complementary, there's a, and can work down to two volts. And with that, for example, you can make a register, a shift register, that you need to serialize information in a circuit like a, an RFID. And you can and you see here one that we realized a few years ago. So this, in, uh, this knowledge and this, uh, let's say, I would say technology uh, from a lab, uh, we transferred to another startup which is called FlipTech, that we created in 2019. <clears throat> and um, it's developing uh, printed uh, microelectronic systems. So circuits plus sensors and actuators. And this is an example of what you can do. Um, and they won the OEA competition in 2021. This is a very simple counter. It's a digital counter. And you it's used to introduce uh, simple uh, counting into a otherwise uh, completely passive and uh, mechanical object like an inhaler. And this can be done without changing at all the shape and the supply uh, chain of the original product. So you introduce a functionality just by attaching it, for example, in this case, to the canister. And this is another way to show how Printed electronics can intervene in what we already use to add functionalities that are useful. Okay, and this is uh, where we are at with uh, this. Uh, so the, the company now is developing its own technologies, and uh, where what are we trying to do uh, more? Well, um, for example, we are working with uh, companies here in the uh, north region of uh, Italy, Lombardia, to deliver printed electronics onto packaging, advanced packaging. The issue is that uh, to do that, you can, either you create a new, completely new process on a new label, and then you try to sell this to these companies, very difficult. Or you try to use their materials where they print their labels, and you try to, to, to show that they are compatible with printed uh, uh, electronics. 
also very difficult. But if you demonstrate that, you have already the technology there. Okay, and this is what we, we did in this uh, uh, in this project. So there is a, I don't, these are local companies. Some of them are very big, like Federigoni, Salvadori. So they they have a proprietary technology for the labels, which have, have no liner less. So there is no waste. Basically, these are self adhesive uh, uh, labels, and they are processed, and, and they have there is a full supply chain going toward the labeling. And we wanted to test whether our printed inks were surviving the whole process of delamination and uh, conversion into a label and uh, a labeling. And this is an example. If it starts, I think it's very heavy. I'm not seeing anything happening anymore. Okay. This is uh, the part where the label is being transferred from the plastic uh, bottle to our app. Okay. Industrial, pre industrial testing uh, facility. And we were quite happy about that. This is a simple transferring of printed uh, conductive circuits, not the, a full system yet, but uh, giving us a lot of hope in the future. And what we, we are uh, on the side, we develop, uh, uh, not with so, so sophisticated uh, technologies, is a, this sort of labels for anti tampering. When you see an energy harvesting device, uh, this is with uh, three red parts here that are uh, powering a simple marker, which uh, shows you that the bottles have been opened and that, that is uh, irreversible. And you want to see that whenever you open the bottle, otherwise you know that someone is interfering. Okay, so, so far what it's already technology and what we are transferring to the market. So, what are we doing at, uh, and what can we do at the uh, research level in order to go beyond the current limits of what we are using uh, uh, to transfer uh, printed electronics to products? Well, we can try to make it as clean as possible, as fast as possible, and even edible. And I see whether I have enough time to go through the, all this uh, <clears throat> in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So thin because we want to make imperceptible devices huh? and uh, uh, fast because uh, we'd like to microelectronic circuits, printed ones and organics to achieve the possibility to transmit information and algo because we have in mind with, on a longer uh, time scale, of course, to have smart fields and direct tagging of food. Uh, regarding thin, uh, I'm going to be okay, short here. So we, you can use the printing printed uh, approaches that I showed you before, exactly the same. Since they are, they are no contact and low temperature, most of them are low contact, anyway, they are gentle, uh, you can use basically all the substrate you want. And here we use this printing to uh, make the circuits that I showed you before, on, instead on, uh, uh, of, uh, on top of tens of micron thick substrate, on the, micron thick parallel layer subject that we put on the bottom and on the top to put the circuit, put the circuit in the neutral plane. Uh, this is similar to what people in uh, Tokyo University did before, but with no printing techniques. And here we use the printing techniques. So now the stress that you are applying on your circuit is so small that you can even crumple them and they keep working. Uh, <clears throat> You can go anywhere. So, for example, you can also print on Matter B. Matter B is a, a industrial uh, level commercial materials for the shopping bag, for the compostable shopping bag. Right? You can print even on, on this kind of bags. Why going there? I'm not sure, but it's just to show you that if you need something biodegradable, you can use Matter B. You can print your circuitry, and then the biochemical, uh, sorry, the biodegradability test that we did here in seawater is not altered by the uh, printed circuits because basically the volume uh, is dominated by, by the bag substrate. <clears throat> and we, actually Fabrizio Viola and Jonathan here were interested in pushing the limit in the thickness. So how thin can we make it? Uh, there were previous example, of course, I uh, cut short on that. So what they did here, they took, uh, uh, in collaboration also with Gilio Mattoli, IIT Pontedera, they took uh, uh, polyvinyl formal PDF to create a, uh, an extremely thin substrate. Uh, it's uh, of 25 uh, nanometers on a wafer, and you coat it, 
you process your susceptible electrodes and semiconductor one part, and you um, release it in water, and you uh, rec uh, recollect it with a plastic ring. Then you coat it again, uh, another uh, layer, and you collect it to have a second PVF layer, and which uh, and on top of this one you can print the, your back electrode, the gate electrode. And so you have a self-standing device which is only 150 nanometers thick, the total stack, which is the thinnest ever made, which works quite nicely. Uh, it's semi-transparent. You see only the contact pad basically. <clears throat> this is uh, contributes to the uh, to make it imperceptible. And uh, given the thickness, you can uh, also wrinkle it up. There are ways of creating wrinkles with a pre-stretched PDMS. And this, because of the thickness, it can achieve a curvature, a sustained curvature radius below one micron, so 700 nanometers. Uh, extremely robust to this kind of curvature radius. So now, uh, moving to instead of uh, speed, why we are interested in making uh, uh, printed fast electronics. Because if we want to have wearables, make wearables typically because we have, we need sensors. So you have an harvester giving power to a sensor and then a circuitry reading that circuit. Then what do you do? You have to, trust, to take the data somewhere, typically to a gateway, right? Which is your smartphone. And how do you do that? You need to transmit information. The only way to do that now is to integrate the silicon chip. There is no other way. So we were interested in pushing the frequencies of our devices so to make them compatible with information data transmission. And you have to go in the multi hundreds of megahertz or even gigahertz to do that. So this was something that we did in the last, uh, uh, I would say, five, eight years, trying to cope with all the known idealities that you have when you do uh, uh, printed electronics. So you have low resolution, so you have a large channel and large overlaps, uh, overlap between gate and source and ray that introduces a huge capacitance limiting the speed, and you have low mobility and so on. In brief, what we did was to couple our printing techniques like inject with other data writing techniques, no contact, like laser machining, and in particular, femtosecond lasers. And the second laser has the, uh, uh, the uh, advantage of allowing you to deposit energy in a very precise way because femtosecond is below uh, the uh, time needed to transmit uh, uh, basically heat. Therefore, you can sinter a metal plastic substrate with uh, avoiding to melt the substrate. And you can achieve <coughs> quite nice resolutions. And nowadays, these uh, lasers are stable. You can parallelize them. We have uh, even mounted one. In, we have already mounted one road to roll machine in our labs. So these are compatible uh, glass, plastic substrate. You can reconstruct the full stack of device on top of these electrodes. In this case, we used a double layer fully solution process dielectrics. I don't have the time to, uh, to discuss more there. And, what we demonstrated is the possibility now to achieve uh, megahertz operation on only two volts apply and up to 14 megahertz at a few volts, like seven volts apply. Okay. And uh, you can make a nice uh, circuit with that. Uh, very simple one is a rectifier. When you use your transistor as a diode, and you can rectify a signal, for example, uh, a signal at uh, 13, uh, 50, 56 megahertz as you need. Uh, in a, a near field uh, passive RFID. Uh, we constructed all the main building blocks required in this uh, RFID. <coughs> Still, this is near field, means that your RFID works at centimeters distance. And there is not so much demand uh, for this kind of electronics made of plastic. Fully plastic because it's so cheap, but we have already that the penetration here is, is um, arguable. So, uh, therefore, our goal was to push forward and to achieve a UHF operation, so ultra high frequency bandwidth, which is in the hundreds of megahertz. So, to do that, we have to overcome first the 100 megahertz. And to cut it short, what we did was to use laser patterning also of the top uh, electrodes in order to re reduce the parasitism between gate and source and drain organs. 
reducing the uh, um, capacitances uh, uh, per city down to something like 100, 200, 10 to far per device. And thanks to this, we achieved the highest uh, frequency of operation achieved in organics so far of 160 megahertz. Unfortunately, now only at high voltage, but we are working on increasing the frequency and lowering the voltage. Okay, so last uh, few minutes, uh, very briefly, I want to introduce what we are trying to do with printing again, uh, shifting a little bit to a different uh, application. So this is Idebol Electronics. Of course, uh, we are not trying to do this. So we are not trying to give anyone any uh, chip, uh, microelectronics chip to eat. And we are doing something. This is, of course, uh, again, is a joke, but this is something more similar to what we are trying to do. And the, in the reality, our uh, devices look like this. These are uh, tattooed uh, arrays of transistors onto a strawberry. So first of all, what is uh, edible electronics? Well, we know ingestible electronics. Huh? This is uh, already existing technology. It's a conventional electronics, microprocessors, uh, encapsulated into a pill, rigid pill, that makes it inert so you can ingest it. And you can do sophisticated functions, even an endoscopy. The thing is that if that it gets stuck inside your body, it's a problem. So this is, has to be administered under strict supervision in a hospital. What we would like to demonstrate is that there is a platform for edible electronics where you can ingest something that performs a function in your body, sensing, and then is digested or even metabolized. So it's degraded within your body like other food. So you don't have to bother about the fate. You are safe. And what we are, uh, how to do that? Well, we have already libraries because there are already materials. Uh, food and food derived materials, and we can find them in the uh, FDA approved list or EFSA approved list that have different functionalities that we need. We have insulators, conductor, and semiconductors. Um, for example, uh, you have a lot of insulators like Argument, is a good dielectric. Uh, you have, for example, edible gold, which is used in a food guard mission, in cake, in the, for example, for cakes, which is. Uh, which a very <laughs> challenging uh, aspect is, uh, of course, uh, as a semiconductor. Of course, we do have beta carotene. We know we can make it in the fact transistor, but they are quite unstable and the, and the properties and the mobility is quite low. But we are working, of course, on extending this. And the long term vision is to make uh, on one side something that you have really to ingest, uh, like a, 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 a smart pill that can uh, register. Uh, the time of ingestion, your pH, what was the temperature, and so on, to make a more uh, uh, specific uh, uh, treatment. And on the other side, you can develop uh, direct tagging of food to tag the food and to uh, certify the quality and its conservation. This is not meant to work from inside. You can even remove it, but without, without the issue of leaving uh, some toxic uh, traces behind. Uh, just a quick uh, way of how we are uh, working on the libraries, we are uh, working on uh, composites like made of uh, activated carbon, beeswax, and oil, and you can make nice conductors. Uh, and pasties, actually, these are pasties, these are bulky. We uh, find the patent on these. We are working on uh, delivering uh, pigments. Pigments are insoluble. Uh, but these pigments, semiconducting pigments, can be made soluble with some functional uh, groups uh, which are thermally cleavable so that you can process them, remove the functional groups, and on the substrate you would have your potentially edible pigment. On the other side, we are studying with other groups the uh, toxicology, and we are doing uh, in vitro studies of the digestion of these materials. So very quickly now, because I have to close, uh, there are also uh, techniques that you need to deliver uh, uh, an edible circuit, and we use tattoo, uh, temporary tattoo paper which releases an extremely thin ethyl cellulose layer, right? the same one used by the kids, and the ethyl cellulose is edible. And you can pattern your um, entire electronic devices of beta 2 and then transferring them, as uh, Leonardo is doing here, so on top of uh, uh, different fruits. And it's, of course, we are playing now a little bit, how we are having fun in the lab, but uh, we do that to play with the limits of this and see how very robust they are, what properties we can get, so on and so forth. 
Of course, an important part is, are these things going to be edible? For the moment, for the semiconductors, mostly we are using uh, very well-known organic semiconductors and no one knows anything about the edibility. We are studying it. And on the other side, when you talk about toxicity, you have to, or not, uh, you have to consider the quantity. And we are including one picogram of semiconductor per device. So even, even a 1,000 uh, circuit with 1,000 um, transistor would uh, have a nanogram of these materials. So to, now, uh, of course, what we have in mind is to build, uh, with, we are working on a complete system. So we need circuit sensors, powering strategies, communication strategies. I don't have time to go into detail. And I'm going to go short here. One of the strategies we use to reduce uh, the uh, operation voltage of transistor, of course, is to use electrolyte KT transistor, as you, I think you heard a lot yesterday about. And you can use water, which is drinkable, but it's not handy uh, in liquid, which is liquid. You can use honey. And this is what Alina recently uh, demonstrated. Hydrated honey is a nice electrolyte, it's a viscous one. And you can get very e e easily uh, known organic semiconductors like PTSD and make it much more stable in air than it would be uh, otherwise. This is quite interesting. We made uh, both N type and P type transistors, and Alina even made uh, some simple ring oscillator circuits that huh? we will eventually need in our uh, printed uh, edible systems. So I hope I gave a little bit also a hint of what we are doing on medieval electronics. Of course, if you are interested, uh, please this uh, progress report. And uh, of course, there is also the web page of the uh, project helpful. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I'd like to stop. These are the part of the collaborators and funding. Uh, I cannot put them all here. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm here for any question you may have. Sorry, I think I, won't, I, go, I went a little bit uh, longer than Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this very, very, very interesting uh, presentation about all the printed and edible electronics. Um, we opened the, the um, session for questions. If anyone has any question, please put it in the chat box or in the Q&A box here. And uh, we can ask them to uh, Professor Mario Carrion. Okay, while we wait for other people to uh, ask some questions, um, I wanted to ask more about the edible electronics. It seems to me that it's something that is very, very, very new. And uh, how, like for me, it's what, what do you think are the main um, uh, drawbacks of currently available uh, materials and processes and you know, other things that, that you can use uh, that are needed to print them like solvents and whatnot? for them to become actually edible. Uh, do you mean the, uh, regarding the car current technologies for ingestible electronics or like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So the, mm -hmm. yeah, so if I go back, um, why we need this, for example, right? And this is, was my first slide. And this is, your, is, is a good question. I went very quickly, but so this technology here, ingestible is existing. And why it's not enough is the fact that I actually spoken to someone that recently in our institute did a, a study on how uh, emotions, this is scientific, yeah? but anyway, emotions uh, scientifically defined were correlated to quantitative parameters in our body, temperature, pH, and they looked for a technology to be able to measure it. So we went, I, I cannot say the company, it's very, very difficult to, to buy this uh, ingestible piece outside the hospitals. They asked to a company, this company was really surprised they were buying their pills. When I discussed with them and they, they were really uh, a bit, I think we were not really feeling safe because even these pills were really small, uh, you have to take them. And hopefully you are, if you are in good shape, you will, uh, uh, you will have no problem. Typically, you cannot give them to uh, people above 40 because of the ways it can get stuck. One of the guys in, in, the, in the trial uh, kept it for six days. <laughs> you can, and it was really scary. So this is a technology existing, doing uh, everything, a lot for you, but uh, it's not really, uh, there, is a re there are real, real risk and concerns. 
Here, if we can make sufficient level of performances, we would like to have something that cannot do an endoscopy, for example, which is out of reach, uh, but at least can reach a pH, for example, can read a pH and so on. And current limits uh, are the fact that we know that some of the solvents, some of the materials are, are toxic. We can exclude all of them, but we don't know a lot about other materials. Are these toxic or not? Who knows? How do you define that is eligible or not? And this is our all the thing. It's not an easy answer, but in the end, we will have a certification. But at development level, it's not easy to say this is edible, this is not. Okay, this is, but uh, there are, I show that there is at least a path that we are following. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Shamim, uh, you raised his hand. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Mario. Thank you so much. Very nice presentation. I, I enjoyed it. Thank and you. Um, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in the rectifier work, which you've shown. If you go to the, those slides, uh, the, the ones, um, yeah, the, the, yeah, the radio frequency rectifier. Uh, so I, I, I think I've kind of missed uh, the material system for, for the, the active part. Uh, and uh, that's one part. And, and, and what other material systems do you think are suitable? And how's the push for the higher frequency for these rectifiers? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Actually, I went very quickly. So there are many ways you can do the rectifier. We also work on the vertical diodes. And we, but I didn't show it here. This is made on, this is a coplanar transistor, basically. Okay. Uh, where is it here? Oh, I didn't show, sorry. Ah, yeah, here. Yeah. So this is uh, basically, this is the, the architecture. So you have a, a, a quite well-known polymer. I mean, commercial one, not high performance. It is 0.1 square centimeter per second mobility. Uh -huh. The architecture that we work uh, on uh, around a lot. And, and we achieved this uh, uh, FT of, well, this is a record one. Let's say FT of 10 megahertz at uh, seven volt. Uh -huh. And the same, same one used in trans diode can give you a diode which works which uh, 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 works uh, enough well uh, up to the NFC uh, range. Of course, why? I mean, this is good, but it's not enough because uh, we don't see, at least we haven't found so many applications at NFC where printed organics is so disruptive. Mm -hmm. What is interesting for us is now going to UHF. Uh, so hundreds of megahertz, because there, uh, therefore, we would need a rectifier at hundreds of megahertz. Because there, if we can have a rectifier at most frequencies and a circuitry which can work as well, we can transmit information at meters distance. In this way, our goal is to be able to make printed text, fully printed and organic, that are able to tag items. Uh, um, goods and transmit their status uh, at readers that are not close by, which is very difficult to be used, but can be in, at a few meters distance. This is our, our goal now. We are not there yet. We are going towards. We reached 160 megahertz high voltage. We need to do further. We have some work in progress, of course, but it will take time. So, so what material systems do you think uh, are, are going to be useful? Because I have worked with some uh, organics, but then I moved on to inorganic uh, because in pursuit of, uh, in pursuit of uh, like high frequency. Yeah, but yeah. then the problem is with the high temperatures, yeah. you know, with the, with the inorganics. So, so yes. do you think there are any suitable materials? Yeah, well, well, I can tell you what we are working on. I mean, I cannot give you the detail, but we are working on blends of polymers and small molecules, mm -hmm. trying to have the same ease and processability of the polymer materials, which is very simple huh? to use inject with the polymers, mm -hmm. and but benefiting from the small molecule, uh, higher uh, uh, electronic properties. And you know that there are already there are a lot of studies on this kind of blends where you use both. With one of those, one single, <laughs> We were able, okay, you can make, and there are literature on high mobility materials like tens per centimeter per second reproducible, real one, not thick. Uh, mm. very, difficult, very difficult part is to integrate them in short channel devices because typically mm. most materials have quite large bandgates. 
we, with combination of, of a blend and, and a dopant, very specific, and an architecture, we were able to integrate uh, that in a short uh, channel device. Of course, it's one and it's research, but we, I see a possibility there. Um, I see a possibility. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And we have one more question before we move to the panel discussion by Shabana Urush. Uh, the question is, have you tried edible electronics for any diagnostic or therapeutics application? Uh, well, I, I, I wish I, I, I could because, I mean, we are, just to clarify, edible electronics basically does not exist. We are developing, a, well, our aim is to develop a platform. So to, to develop all the components and show that this is feasible. Of course, what we would like to, uh, to have in the end is something that can do this sort of application for us. But this is the reason why we are working, I showed you a, a transistor, but we are working on circuits, sensors, and importantly, communication strategies and powering up. Until we find a suitable way of this, we cannot even try to address those, uh, those applications. But that's, uh, of course, what we are aiming for. 